enjoyed a passion for writing throughout your life, and you were obviously a risk taker as you moved from Toronto to LA and immediately landed an assignment to write for NBC's Bold Ones. Tell us how you went about landing that first screenwriter's assignment. And I imagine you're a good networker, or maybe all the stars were aligned. <laughs> uh, I think the stars were aligned. The stars were aligned, eh? <laughs> okay. I, uh, I I flew down to, to Los Angeles, um, and I was to meet uh, an agent at William Morris I had never met before, because my agent at William Morris was out of New York. Um, and uh, the agent that I met uh, uh, said to me, there's a new series starting at NBC, a medical series, would you be interested in, in uh, uh, writing for it? And I said, yes. So she got on the phone immediately with the producer. And she said, I've got a writer here from Toronto who's also a doctor. And he said, does he have any stories? And I lied and said, yes, I do. <laughs> of course, you have to lie when you're first starting. <laughs> and so he said, send him up. So I drove from Beverly Hills out to Universal Studios in the Valley, which is, a, which is about a 25-minute drive, during which time I... I conjured up a story based on an article I had written, or rather read on the airplane, and went into the producer's office, pitched the story, and got the assignment. That was Wow, and that's just, you just nicely landed then. You just arrived in LA. Yeah. Wow. Just arrived. But, but, but that's flying by the seat of your pants, and that's what you have to do, isn't it? No, I was flying by the seat of my pants. That's yes. Right. But it, it was so good that you had your, your medical background. I mean, it, yeah, my medical background has been incredibly important for my writing career. Um, not only because I've had to deal with people in, in the worst situations in their lives and how they react to it, but also because it was impressive for producers and studio executives because they had never seen anybody who had a medical degree <laughs> also be a writer so well, <laughs> they were they were impressed and I, because of that I think uh, I got a lot more work than I would probably have gotten well I think that's marvelous have you ever thought about uh, ever going back to medicine or it was interesting because you always had that passion for writing didn't you the whole time probably oh, yeah. when you were going to med school well yeah because uh well, I started writing when I was 16. I was sending short stories into the Montreal Star, Weekend Star. And then uh, um, all through high school, I wrote I wrote short stories. And when I went to Toronto to go to, to the university, uh, I, I was interested in playwriting uh, because I was a radio baby. You know, those in those days, we did not have TV. Uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah I, I think I was I think I was 16 years old before we ever had a TV in our house. So um, I wanted to become a, a, a history uh, or English or both teacher because I figured I could spend the summers, you know, writing for myself. And, and so I enrolled at Queen's University and, and was accepted and had my room. I was all set to go. Went to Toronto for. Uh, for a little vacation before school started. That's where my dad's family was. And my uncle, who was a doctor, said, what do you want to do with your life? I said, you know, um, I want to be a writer. And he said, well, why do you want to go to school and, and learn uh, about writing from people who you know, have not been involved in anything but writing, right? Go to medical school, become a doctor, become a participant in life not an observer. Oh, well, that's a good point, a participant. Well, well you so said- I, I, Yes, yeah, so I switched. That's, that's why I switched. Well, that's it. But I think it's hard if you're, if you're writing. I mean, when you're going to med school, the hours are incredible you have to put in. and You still manage to fit time in to write. Yeah, the, the, my, the toughest year was my first year, and I didn't do any writing my first year of medicine. So you missed it, obviously. 
Well, I did miss it, but on the other hand, you know, I, I ended up being, I, th I think I stood 20th in a class of 165. And I thought if I have to work this hard to be 20th, right? It's ridiculous. I'm just going to write and relax. And that's what I did from then on. So, I mean, you probably I probably did better because you were in a relaxed state. You, you kind of had made that decision. You know, I stayed in the top third of my class and that's all I wanted. Well, that was good. Interesting. Okay. My next question. Since you have experienced such a varied career, which medium and why do you prefer? as your medium of choice, as a novelist, screenwriter, or that of a TV director, as you obviously excel at, at all of these uh, areas? I think probably uh, it's hard for me to decide between writing and directing because uh, I'm not a social animal and writing keeps me in my cave. But uh, after I've been writing for four or five months, uh, the idea of going out and directing, which is completely social, uh, was very rewarding. So bouncing back and forth between the two of them was terrific. Uh, between writing uh, screenplays and novels, it's hard for me to judge that because I, I love writing novels. But on the other hand, I, I arrived at the novel very late in my career. And... Um, I came at a time very recently where writing novels uh, doesn't have the rewards that it used to have. Um, writing for television, I, I was very fortunate because I arrived at the very best two decades possible for writing, and that was the 70s and 80s yeah, into, into the 90s. Uh, today, writing for television is very, very difficult. I can imagine it's really, really difficult to break in. But, uh, oh, absolutely. Very difficult to break in. And you've got so much competition. You know, I mean, I remember when I first came to California, basically, you had one film school. That was USC, right? Now you've got film schools everywhere in the country. And they're churning out all these writers. and Absolutely. Directors. Yeah. Yeah. But... So there isn't one that you kind of prefer over the other, like all you you enjoy all of all of them. But as you said, in, as a novelist, it is harder. I think it isn't instant gratification by any means, is it? Here's I'm looking at all the novelists here on the screen, but it is a yeah. It's very yeah. difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult as a writer to go to get anywhere without an agent, because because producers uh, or publishers do not want to spend their time reading novels from, from uh, writers that they, that they don't know. And so you need an agent to get, to get out there and work for you. And unfortunately, that's not what's happening today with agents because you know they, they go after the big names. I mean, if you're a big celebrity and you want to write a novel, it's easy for you to get an agent because they know that the publisher is going to want to read the novel. Right? But what, what if you're just starting out? Is there any, <laughs> any advice? It's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. I mean, writers, you know, writers uh, are writers. Writers have to write. Writers love to write. Um, but where their work goes from that point on, is dependent on so many other factors. There's a lot of variables. Even here now, like a, a lot of cases, uh, publishers ask if you have an agent. It's oh yeah, or pitch a, a book now without an agent. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, I had I had an agent. I, I had my agent for 35 years. Then he retired. When he retired, I couldn't find another agent because really? of my agent. Oh, and with yeah. your experience, it was difficult to, to land another one? My age. That was it. You know, I mean, the agents are 30 years old and they want to they want to be buddies with their writers and their writers are going to be young. Or they're people that they went through they went to college with. You know, they're all friends. Uh, so friendships are very important in the business. 
Oh. And I guess it helps if you're young. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. But anyway, no, that, that was one of my questions later on was like ageism. It, uh, we're, we've all been up against it and we've learned to kind of work through it. But it's there, isn't it? And I guess it's probably really prevalent in L.A. Oh, very much so. Very much so. I mean, even, uh, I mean, my best friend is a very, very successful writer. He's written, he's written probably a hundred thousand, he sold probably a hundred thousand novels during his career, which has been going on now for 40 years. And he's, he signed with a, with a huge publisher, but, but that publisher doesn't even do his PR anymore. He has to do his own. Despite well, that's, the fact. that's the case here. Uh, you know, there, there's the, the very large ones. They do look after your PR, but no, that's that's quite common here as well. You know, well, it's, and it's he, 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 he's got a huge. He's got he's paying. He's got Penguin Publishing. You know, I mean that. Oh, Penguin, and they won't do any PR. He does it himself, but he loves doing it. Well, See, I, I don't. I hate doing that stuff. He loves <laughs> isn't it. Your thing, eh? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you're a self-promoter, you can go a long way because well, you have it, to promote I, yourself. But I know publishers look for that now in a writer. Yeah. Not only their, their manuscript has to be great, but they have to be able to project and, and be able to get out there and, you know, promote. And then not all writers can do that. You know, that's like, right. Exactly. That's a challenge. OK, my next question. At one point in your career, you have written for TV's very popular detective series, Ironside. Now, do you want to tell us about that popular series? I loved it. I really did. And what it was like to write for them. Uh, was it a learning curve for you? And if you can tell us if you met Canadian actor Raymond Burr, who starred in the series. So there's the, probably three questions in one in this. Yeah, we're all anxious to, to hear about Raymond. <laughs> Okay, uh, I, I, the the producers who produced the bold ones also produced Ironside, and uh, was that your end because you did work on the bold? Yeah, ones? and so uh, and so after I had written a few bold ones, which were medical, um, I did not want to be uh, pigeonholed as a medical writer. So uh, because I had written other stuff before that in Canada, and so I said to the producer, I want to write an episode of Ironside. And uh, and he said, fine. So I wrote a couple of episodes of Ironside. Um, but the funniest moment uh, on Ironside was when I met Raymond Burr. Um, I had come out to, because I was going back and forth between Toronto and, and Los Angeles. And I had come out. <laughs> come out. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> what that was. Continue, Sander. <laughs> anyway, I, you know, I, if if you remember Ironside, Ray Burr was in a wheelchair all the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so I came out to California. And while I was here, the producer said to me, hey, we're shooting a, an episode right now. How would you like to work? Uh, and, and uh, you know, we're finishing the episode. So why don't you come over, you know? And, and have a drink with the crew and everything. I said, okay. So I went over there and I'm standing there having a drink and Raymond Burr walked in and absolutely stunned me because he walked. He was in wheelchair, Bob. <laughs> I mean, I had only seen him in a wheelchair. <laughs> good point, good point, yeah. 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 <laughs> now was it a learning curve for you working on the uh, iron side um there wasn't i mean as far as writing was concerned it, it wasn't you know, there was no real learning curve there um the uh uh whether you're doing medical or whether you're doing detective uh whatever you know i mean it's you know it's it's basic writing you know, and you just follow the, you know, the 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 table of contents for writers, which I have I've always considered it the seven C's. 
of writing. Yeah. And that's that's how I approach everything. C being the 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 uh, alphabetical C, right? Okay. And uh, what so, are the seven C's? <laughs> um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we're all curious. <laughs> uh, consistent and colorful characters in conflict leading to confrontation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, uh, what's the other one? What have the other one? Conclusion. Okay. And change. And change. Because any and good story, know. any good story, uh, you know, the characters that you put them, Yeah, something happens at the end. Some people, uh, you know, there's a change. So, and when I say colorful, I'm not talking about necessarily about flamboyant characters, right? I'm talking about characters that, well, for example, um, Peter Sellers, Peter Sellers, right? Peter, Peter Sellers, uh, uh, when he did Pink Panther, was a very flamboyant character, right? Very colorful, um, playing Inspector Clouseau, right? But then he did a movie called Being There, for which he won an Academy Award. He was the blandest character you could ever imagine, right? But he was interesting because that was his color. He was interesting, you know? And that, that to me is, co that's colorful. Consistent because what happens is that you create a character or you create characters, you, they have to stay consistent with the character you've created all the way through uh, the, 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 the script or the story. Uh, too many times I've been watching something and all of a sudden, the character that the writers have set up so beautifully um, all of a sudden does something that is completely out of character for that person, for that character. So you have to really keep that in mind when you're writing the script, then, don't you? Yeah, because what, because what I say when I see that is this is being writer-driven, right? It's not being character-driven. It's being writer-driven. The writer wants to say something, right? And even though it doesn't fit the character he's created, he goes ahead and says it. So for me, that's the, you know, that that's always a problem when you're writing. Okay, interesting. Now I, I think we can look for that in different series. Then, if all of a sudden a character takes off in a totally different direction, then as you say, that's that's writer driven, then isn't it? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. All right. Oh, did you talk about when you met Raymond? Where is he from in Canada? I wasn't sure. I don't. I think he's from the from the prairies. I think from the. Uh, I think I'm not sure. Okay, so he's from out west. Then. I think he's from out west. Well, I can't remember him in Moose Jaw, <laughs> where <laughs> I'm from. But anyway, <laughs> no, interesting. I really liked him. He was. Was he a really nice, personable guy, too? Yeah, he was. He was, okay. No. Okay, the next question. Thriller, mystery books, as well as crime, detective novels, plus mystery TV series, all, to, all appear to be very popular now. What do you attribute to the fact that they have gained so much in popularity? Perhaps viewers and readers' mindsets have changed before or after the COVID lockdown? Or do you have any idea why they're really popular? I know Bell, our, uh, our, our Zoom guy, he writes mysteries too. And there's so many people I know who are writing mysteries. So I think it, there's certainly a surge in popularity. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I think there are probably a lot more mysteries today than there than there have been, but I don't think it's necessarily because there's a surge in popularity. Mysteries have always been popular. I mean, when I was a kid, like nine, ten years old, I used to listen to the radio. I listened to the Shadow. Uh, oh, I remember that one too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, oh, yeah. I loved those in those days, and everybody did. Now, what you don't find a lot of these days 
uh, are the screwball comedies that used to be so popular, let's say in the 30s and 40s. Um, and I don't know why that is. Uh, it, it's just, it's just um, maybe it's because uh, they don't they don't have the the the, the act the acting uh, caliber that they had. I don't know. I mean, they, there there seems to be there seems to be a lot of of uh, drama uh, escapism really, but. People used to escape more more frequently to comedy, I think, than they do today. I think, well, that like Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. And, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, the yeah. Black Brothers and you know all, all of those. Classes. Well, you've all, but you've also got a lot of you've got a lot of uh, uh, competition mm -hmm. today from television. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so much. There's so much. Comes, the shark sound, and I think it's going to do the old talking. Oh dear, I don't know <laughs> what's happened there. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Somebody unmuted okay. and uh, it's a voice in the room, you yeah. know. Oh, okay. Is it okay? Okay. Now, this is the big question. We're all leaning in. What tips could you give our members if they wish to try their hand at screenwriting? I know we have to think visually. But that's what everybody usually starts off, uh, you know, advising us. But what are some other writing techniques and and or being disciplined or uh, how do you want to uh, you know uh, approach this and tell us what what's worked for you maybe it'll work for us as well i think uh uh knowing the beginning middle and end of your story before you start writing it as a screenplay i think that's important so you know exactly where you're going um you have to have at the end for you know so you know exactly okay that's a good point yeah because if you start writing a screenplay and you have no idea where it's going to end up it's it becomes problematic for you because you could spend an awful lot of time going back and forth um you know uh, being visual of course is very important and as i said i was born a radio baby and when i started writing uh, uh, teleplays for the CBC, uh, uh, I got very nice responses and they really liked them, but they said, not visual enough, try radio, which of course is not something I wanted to do. That wasn't in, in the cards. Yeah. Really, but, and they used to call radio the medium for the blind, but I don't agree because you have to use your imagination. But Exactly, yeah. Um, but I was fortunate because at the time that I was writing, uh, I could write a script and send it into the CBC and they'd read it. And I didn't have an agent, right? Oh, that'd be pretty tough these days now. Sandra. Exactly. So yeah, it, it's yeah. just a lot, well, it's just yeah. very, very hard these days to, you know, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the Canadian scene as I used to be, but that was many years ago. And uh, at the time, at that time, uh, it was much easier for a writer. Well, and also, like your process for writing, I think you have to be very disciplined, don't you? And do you have any particular process that you follow? Or? Um, no, I used to I used to write uh, probably about four, maybe four to five hours a day. Um, when I was in medical school, um, uh, I would write. Uh, you know, I would write in the in the evening after I did after I studied. Um, so I didn't have an awful lot of time. Mostly, I, I work on weekends. When, when I uh, when I started my medical practice, um, I would I would uh, go to the office after uh, after dinner, and I, I would see patients until nine o'clock, and then I start writing, and I'd write for two hours. I'd write. From nine yeah, after you after nine after you've seen patients okay. yeah it's a long write. day isn't it yeah yeah because i was i'd be up at six to go to the hospital to do my patient rounds at uh at, at the mount sinai hospital first thing in the morning uh yeah it was a long day uh and then i would i, I would write on the weekends as well so yeah, I hand it to you. I don't know how you did it all through med school. I think that was that was a real challenge. But anyway, uh, you did. Now, do you find like I, I wanted to ask you as well about this wasn't included in your questions, 
but about directing. Like, how did you find that? I know Reva's done that, your sister. She's certainly been directing quite a few stage plays. Well, I got interested in directing. Uh, uh, I went from writing to producing. I was producing Mod Squad, and I produced Mod Squad. And uh, uh, even as a producer, I didn't have the control over my scripts that I wanted to have because that was up to the director on the stage. And uh, there were some, there were direct, there were directors that I, I, whose work I didn't appreciate. And so I thought I, in order, in order to take control of what I write, I want to direct. And so um, Interesting. Wow. I went to, uh, from Mod Squad, I went to producing uh, uh, Doc Elliott and um, while I was producing Doc Elliott, I, you know, I was, I was, I had a commitment for seven episodes, but the network liked them so much. They wanted me to stay on and do another five. And I said, I will do it if you let me direct an episode. And uh, okay, so that's what the stipulation that you gave them. And yeah. Then, so they let, they let me direct an episode and then I would jump from that into directing a movie for television. But interesting. Cause that's so you felt that was the only way you could control what you'd written. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are times when, uh, you know, I had directors do a really good job on what I, when I wrote, but too often I was not happy. So. Well, that's interesting. No, I wouldn't have thought that. That's, that's good to know. Okay. Now we're coming into uh, your novelist uh, career. Okay. So Bella, we're going to cue you in a few minutes and you're going to be pulling up uh, the uh, cover for Material Witness, uh, Sanders' book. Okay. Tell us about your latest published crime novel called Material Witness. Now, what inspired you to write it? And did you pattern the characters after anyone in particular, as you would have plenty of fascinating characters, I imagine, uh, living in L.A.? Yes. So tell us what, what inspired you to write that. So, Bella, do you want to just pull up the... Okay, here it is. Oh, do you want to pull it up a little higher? We can't read the bottom part. I don't know. Available at. Yeah. Yeah, you're reading it. Okay, it's available at Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. Okay, that's great. Okay. No, I, I like the cover. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a good cover. Good cover. Okay, thanks, Bella. That's good. Now, um, um, so I, wrote, I wrote material uh, witness uh, as a screenplay in 1968. Oh, okay. And uh, I, I brought it with me to Los Angeles, uh, tried to get it made as a movie. I even had a meeting with Kirk Douglas who wanted to play uh, the lead, but we couldn't get the, we couldn't raise the money. And over the years, you know, at different times I've come close, but was never able to, to, to make it work. Uh, and then, you know, last year I thought, I'm going to turn it into a novel. And that's what I did. Well, yeah. terrific, because you don't like to have anything go to waste that you've written and that you, you exactly. recycled it then, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Okay. So Now, was there anyone in particular who inspired you or a character that you patterned it after? Like, how did you come by the whole concept? Um, no, there was no specific character. Um, uh, it, it started off with, uh, with the lead, Matos, Sam Matoski was his name. Um, and it was set in Toronto, so it's, it was Toronto. Believe. Oh, really? So like yeah. you said, you wrote it quite a few, number of years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was all set in Toronto, and then when I came down to the States, I moved it all into Los Angeles, um, and then wrote it as a novel set in Los Angeles. But because I was, li because I'm living here, it was a lot easier for me to, to, you know, get a proper look at the landscape. Well, I, I, I think uh, I think that's so good that you did recycle it because I know we've we've all got these stories and half written manuscripts sitting in drawers and they just kind of lie there. It's good that you did bring it out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, I was going to ask you if you would read an excerpt, and you've got a little more than three minutes if you want to from your book, Material Witness. 
Um, all right, I shall do that. Oh, yes. Detective Sam Matoski sat in his jockey shorts, shivering from the air conditioning blast that Dr. Irv refused to turn off. Neither Los Angeles summer day of 100 degrees nor a February day of half that temperature made a difference. Cold was better. Of course, insulation with an extra 60 pounds of adipose tissue worked in Irv's favor, but shivering from cold was the least of Sam's problems at this moment. He was here because the pain had returned this morning. It seems silly to even call it a pain. It was just a mild ache beneath his lower jaw not worthy of a single aspirin. But this was its fourth appearance in two weeks. It surfaced with exertion and disappeared with rest. You didn't need a medical degree to figure the pattern might be significant. Dr. Irv certainly thought so because he must have drained a quart of blood for his battery of tests. Sam looked at the bandage covering the puncture wound on his forearm and made a mental note to get rid of it before anyone at work spotted it. That would be a problem he didn't need. Noticing the Venetian blinds were off kilter, he surveyed the room for other familiar sights. A crack in the ceiling from the earthquake of 94 remained untouched. Irv's diplomas hung askew. The water dispenser still held no cups. Sam took comfort in all this. After 20 years, he knew this room better than his reflection in the mirror above the sink. What had 50 years of living done to him? He had been a muscular at one, he had been muscular at one time, sculpted biceps, pecs, abs. Where did they go? Where did his hair, when did his hair become thin and gray and his eyebrows a single bush? When did his belly sag and his shoulders round in perpetuity? How did it all sneak up on him? Getting to his feet, he gazed harder at his mirror image. He used to be six feet tall. He seemed shorter now. Pulling his shoulders back and straightening his spine, he stretched for that imagined height. The door opened and Irv caught him in mid preen Like what you see, Sam? Sam shook his head and sighed. Now I know why the eyes go as you age. Dr. Irving Chesler sat his broad ass on the tiny stool and began scribbling on a chart while his gut strained at the buttons of his lab coat. Sam noted with some satisfaction that despite their comparable age, Irv looked out of shape and considerably older. Can I get dressed, Sam inquired. Get dressed, Irv muttered, engrossed in his notes. Sam moved to the wall peg that held his clothes. So what's the verdict? Irv waved the ECG tracing in his pudgy fist. No sign of muscle damage, but I want to send you out for some special uh, x-rays on your coronary arteries. Irv, don't give me baby talk. If you mean angiogram, say angiogram. Angiogram. The word caught Sam's attention. He had hoped he was wrong. You're having angina pain, Sam. Your blood vessels are closing. I know what angina is, Sam snapped. Ignoring Sam's annoyance, urge forged on. When's a good day for you to have an angiogram? My 75th birthday. How about Monday? Slipping into his trousers, Sam quietly contemplated the situation. Irv looked up quizzically. Monday okay? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Get back when? Today? Tomorrow? It's already Thursday. Sam slipped into his collar frayed dress shirt. I've got some personal business to take care of, then I'll do it. We're talking about a serious situation here. Hey, if the angiogram's normal, I'll have wasted a work day. If it's not, we're talking bypass and I don't have the time. When I do, I'll let you know. Irv watched as Sam slid an arm into a shoulder holster bearing a police issued Glock revolver. You are one stubborn son of a bitch. Should I bring your brother into this? Sam shot him a hard glare. Not a word. 
The last thing he wanted was to have his doctor brother haranguing him. You know where I stand with my father. Once I get him settled somewhere, I'll come barging, banging on your door for whatever you want to throw at me. Okay? Irv nodded, surrendering. Do it fast. Sam slipped on his sport coat. Do me a favor. Don't put this through my insurance. I'll pay cash. Why? Just do it, please. Realizing he should not pursue this, Irv shrugged and riffled through a drawer of drug samples. Call me in a couple of days for your blood tests. He offered a small bottle. It's nitroglycerin. If you get that pain, slip one under your tongue. If the pain doesn't go away in two minutes, get to an emergency room. And, if, and I want you to cut out the three Bs, booze, broads, and butter. Sam <laughs> thought that will never happen as he accepted the bottle and affectionately patted the doctor's bulging gut. And you call me when you go into labor. With a loud guffaw, he hurried from the room. Very good. Very <laughs> good. I, I really like booze, broads, and butter. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You see, so you, your your medical background has certainly helped you because you know, yeah, it always helps. You, you really had the down pad as far as the whole uh, procedure in the doctor's office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, very good. That's good. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you. Uh, the, this is the final question. And what new project do you have in the works currently? Is it a novel, or what are you planning? I am the same. <laughs> that always gets everybody. Say, oh well. Uh, actually, I'm working on a novel, also based on a screenplay that I wrote years ago. Um, but it deals with uh, vampires. Um, They're in vogue right now, aren't they? <laughs> it's based, yeah. It, it's 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 basically the Sopranos as vampires. As vampires. <laughs> Italian vampires. Okay. They're, yeah, they're not Italian, but they are. But they are a mafia. Mafia-based vampires. Okay. Mafia so vampires. That sounds really interesting. So when you start, if you're you're doing your outline of your story, so you you kind of come up with the end first, that you kind of know what you're gonna how you're gonna end it. Well, actually, uh, I already have an ending because I wrote it as a screenplay, so I know exactly where I'm going with it. Oh, okay. So, so you've already written the screenplay. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. That sounds like a, a very interesting uh, project, Sandra. Very interesting. Okay. 